<laughs> Here at the Mobile Health Conference, we're talking to John Madison, and he's working from Kaiser Permanente. And I, I live there, and Kaiser Permanente is huge in America. How many patients are connected to it? 10 million patients. Yeah. 10 million, and, and you have basically spent a lot of time innovating. I mean, they're really seen there as an honest innovator in the healthcare. What are the messages which you want to bring to the Netherlands, which you've learned the hard way in the last uh, 10 years? Well, I think the first thing is, is the technology is an incredibly potent tool to create innovation, but most importantly, we have to think of what it is we're trying to do and why it is we're trying to do it. So we have to have a goal of increasing the value uh, to each of our members and the quality of the outcomes and their, their satisfaction, and we need to be able to do that at an affordable cost. And in order to do that, we need to have comprehensive care, we need to have an incentive system that's aligned with that so that uh, our all of our employees realize that what we're really after is every decision that they make is intended to make the life of the person in front of them better. And I use the word person rather than patient very deliberately mm -hmm. because I think patient-centric is an oxymoron. And the reason it's an oxymoron is because patients is what doctors call people. People contain a patient persona, but in fact they have a life outside of, of any illness that they might have. Mm -hmm. and. An example that I like to point to is if you look at people with diabetes, half of them do not have good control of their diabetes, and almost invariably those people have a very high percentage of depression. Mm -hmm. So if we don't treat the depression, we call them non-compliant because they're not doing what we say. Well, we're the ones that are not compliant because we don't have enough time or empathy to understand why it is that they're not compliant and treat the depression. And then okay. go but, right but, but John, but John, yeah. You basically set so many conditions, so many conditions. Every, the stars have to be aligned to make a new system. And you know, coming from an example from America, it looks like that's impossible. You cannot do that. I think that's. I, I think that you cannot do it overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the important point. We had a genius by the name of Sidney Garfield who created a vision 70 years ago, and we've been refining that vision for the past 70 years. He published his whole information technology ICT support for that integrated vision in 1970 in Scientific American. Mm -hmm. And we are still working on implementing both his vision of quality improvement and person-centric care and integrated systems. And so to think that you can replicate all that in a couple of years, I think is very uh, misguided. So what should we do in a simple way, the Dutch? What can we start with? I think the important thing to realize is that, that every community, every medical community uh, in uh, Holland has its own unique set of strengths and weaknesses. So I think it's I think it's pretty easy to put a target out there of what the end state needs to look like, but I think there has to be a lot of uh, understanding that it can't be done overnight and that the way you get from each of these different strengths and weaknesses in the communities to that end goal may be a little bit different journey. So one of the mistakes I think that has happened in the U.S. in the attempt to create more healthcare that looks like Kaiser Permanente mm -hmm. is that there are very tight timelines and very aggressive goals. So I think it's important to coalesce around a common goal, to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the local community, and to construct a roadmap where you can make some quick, uh, early successes mm -hmm. that you can build on. So you can motivate the process. Now, exactly. share with me three results which this whole process has reached for by per Kaiser Permanente. What has changed? How have you used IT? How have you improved the quality? And what, what are the things you're proud of, the three things? Uh, most importantly is the fact that we bring great transparency through the digital world. So we look at how every single physician is doing in terms of preventive measures, in terms of, of uh, taking care of wellness of every one of our patients in terms of outcomes of, of all of the members that they treat. And so we don't just talk the talk, we actually put part of their salary at risk, a substantial part of their salary at risk. For preventive care, also preventive, preventive care and quality outcomes. Yeah. And so you get what you incentivize. And so to the extent that we have been able to build trust in the metrics that we use for quality and preventive care and apply that equally to everybody and then make it transparent transparent, it's clear that people want to perform well and want to be seen if as incentivized, a if incentivized well. What exactly. role and what kind of technology have you, uh, have you used uh, for that? 
Um, well, we, we have elaborate analytic tools that mine the data because all of the data now is digital. So we don't have to, we used to have to, we used to do this in the past with paper charts and it was very costly, very painful and people could say, oh, I don't trust your data, sample size wasn't big enough and, and often they had valid points. But now we have access to all this digital data and we provide complete transparency into how we do the analytics, what we're measuring and how that's linked to the incentives. So you have to build trust incrementally don't start off, again, same thing as, as the whole vision, yeah. don't start off with all the metrics and a big financial impact right away. Yeah. Start simple, start small, uh, both in terms of, of what the goals are and what the financial incentives are, and then over time, increase the number of metrics and the, and the amount of incentive at risk, and, and that's the pathway. And, that's the and they've done that in the States, which is an incredible difficult system with incredible difficult incentivize, and which we owe everybody, politicians are just fighting, and, and you have been very steadily doing that, and that trust, they don't see all these digital tools as spying on you for, for saving money. No, they really see it, the, 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 the providers of care see that. So that's really interesting. It took about five years to get past that, you're spying on us, don't tell me what to do. Um, but once we got past that, built trust in the metrics and the data and the analytics, um, yes, there, there is now trust in that, but it didn't come overnight. If you now look at other things like the Internet of Things and like uh, p patients being able to measure themselves and, and, and do a lot of control, are you also uh, implementing that in your uh, model? We are. Um, we started off like most um, institutions trying to do too many things, um, spread too thin. We had 571 digital health pilots going at the same time. And so what we realized is that that's not a really effective way to do innovation. So we're, con we're constraining the number of projects that we're really focusing on, starting with the high impact ones like diabetes, like hypertension. We haven't picked the third one yet, but I would like to see mindfulness and it comes back to the issue, mindfulness, mindfulness absolutely, of um, uh, devices that actually help you understand how you are managing your own stress, like heart math, like the Muse, like Happy Tech here in the Netherlands, that gives very simple summary information about how much stress you're experiencing in the moment so that you can, you can chill out, drop your stress level, improve your physiology, improve your, your resistance, and in addition, there's, there's a tremendous literature about how uh, mindfulness and meditative arts and social support structures have a huge impact on your resilience. Uh, Carnegie Mellon did a study with 400 patients and exposed 400 people to the same virus. Those who had a healthier social support structure actually resisted infection and had lesser symptoms than those who did not have the social support structure and it was independent of how much social stress they were under. Wonderful. Mindfulness and trust and new technology. Thank you very much, Thank John, for coming. Much.